So my name is Richard. I'm Sadiq. And we're here to talk about continuous profiling in production, what, why, and how. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about why uh, performance tools matter, why you might need tools to understand performance problems in your application stack. And we'll talk about the differences between like a development environment and a production environment, and, and, and why just looking at things in development might not be the right way to understand performance problems. And then look at a few different kind of approaches at the high level as to how we can uh, solve these things. So firstly, at, at a very high level, like why do performance tools matter? Well, firstly, when you think about software development problems, I think there's kind of three kind of broad categories of things that, that, that you get. And this applies to performance problems and performance aspects of your software as, as much as others. The first one's no known. So these are kind of like the theoretically the easy aspects of your software, right? So you know that reading data out of your main memory is going to be faster than reading data off a hard disk. You, you can have that in your mental model. That's something that you can confidently uh, bank on. Then you've got your known unknowns, OK? So these are things, aspects of your software system where you know that there could be a potential for a performance problem there but you don't know how big of an issue it is. For example, every time you've got uh, an unbounded size of Q in a production system, you don't know whether it'll be a performance problem, but you know it, it could be uh, an issue there. You know that there's this uh, main memory disk speed ratio difference, but you don't know how big it is until you actually look at it in some particular um, System. So these are things that you, you may not know all the details on, but you can plan ahead for. Okay? You can uh, mentally model, you can think through. And then there are the unknown unknowns, the real kind of spanner in the works problems. These don't necessarily have to be hard or complicated, but they could be something like you spent months building a beautiful, well thought through, scalable parallel algorithm. And then you've got a sequential logger in the middle of this system that's slowing everything down to the speed of one thread. And you didn't think about that. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't necessarily think about those kind of issues ahead of time until you hit them in production, until they're real problems for your system. The, the things that you, maybe with hindsight, you would think, oh, yeah, I'd, I'd get that next time. But until you hit it, it's an unknown unknown. And a lot of the other th aspects of software performance can be planned ahead. You can uh, architect and design for known knowns and for known unknowns. But unknown unknowns, you're going to need to have something that measures how that system actually works to understand how, those perform how you can solve those performance problems. Okay? Now, initially, when we look at a lot of uh, aspects of software correctness, for example, testing, we look at running automated tests in a development environment. So, Sadiq, if we do testing in development for the correctness of our programs, why can't we just do that for performance problems as well? And why can't, why, why can't we just do that for everything? Right. Well, over the next few slides, we're going to go through why, from a performance point of view, uh, testing in development is not representative of production. And we should take a step back just before we start this. Our, our goal for performance testing is to remove bottlenecks from production, right? We do this performance work to make production go quicker or produce less waste. Uh, if our goal was to make development go quicker, well, then we could do it a different way. But if we're trying to make production go quicker, uh, then uh, we need to actually do our performance testing in production. Um, and it's a problem because actually performance testing and development is easier. The, the tools that we're used to using uh, are, are desktop tools, the desktop profilers, your visual, you know, J, J profiler, visual VM, what have you. Um, you may not have access to production. Um, there are many organizations I've worked in, I'm sure many of you here, uh, where there are strict rules around who has access to production. Uh, it might be organizational, it might be regulatory reasons. But as we're going to see over the next few slides, uh, as easy as it is doing performance testing and development, it is not representative of production. And our goal here is to actually understand the performance of production. So the first problem we've got is unrepresentative hardware. Who here develops on exactly the same kind of hardware they actually deploy to in production? 
I'm there's always one yeah, there's person. always one person there's at the always back one with person. a really big beard. And uh, <laughs> uh, so you, you might you might develop on a on a two or or if you're lucky four core laptop uh, that's optimized for power consumption. You know, try and make that battery last as long as possible. Whereas when you deploy to production, you might be on 24 core, 32 core, multiple socket machines that have very different memory uh, topologies. Uh, you, Sadiq, doesn't that just mean, though, your production servers are a bit faster? So if you can find the bottleneck on your laptop and you can fix it on your laptop, it's going to run better in production, right? It's bigger hardware, it's faster. Bigger is not always better. So from the point of view of, 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 uh, of production, if you imagine that you have, say, a, a two core a processor in your laptop and you have a 24 core processor in your server, what you're going to see is a shift in the kind of bottlenecks that turn up. So if you've got a 24 core, if you're sorry, if you've got a two core uh, processor in your laptop, you may, uh, may just not see a lock contention issue that actually is a big problem in production when you now have many, many cores. So just because the system is bigger doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's, it's anyway better representative. And you're going to see the same problem with, say, I.O. subsystems. So uh, on your server class uh, hardware, you're likely to have very high performance, very throughput, latency optimized uh, I.O., uh, NVMe, SCSI, uh, NVMe SSDs and such like. Whereas on your laptop, you have things that are generally, generally uh, tuned for power. And that means the bottlenecks will shift. What might be a I.O. bottleneck on your laptop will probably turn into an actual uh, CPU bottleneck on a server where you're no longer sat there waiting on the disks all the time. And that's before we get to modern cloud environments where uh, the hardware you get is often very opaque and sometimes, you know, basically a mechanical potato is what some of those servers are running. Very, very much slower than uh, modern laptops and desktops for, for a lot of cases. And the next thing is unrepresentative software. So let's just show our hands again. Who is running exactly the same software on their development environment as they do in production? OK, just a number of more people. Um, I mean, in organizations I've worked in over the last few years, uh, uh, development hasn't actually even happened on the same operating system as, as uh, production. You know, often you've got Mac laptops and you have Linux running in, in production. Uh, but even if you're running the same operating system, uh, the, the actual versions of the operating system uh, that you run makes a big difference. And we saw that, uh, we saw that um, in a big way with the Spectre and Meltdown issues the last few years, where different Linux versions, uh, the way that they actually implement these, uh, these mitigations, the different kernel versions, actually had dramatically different performance characteristics around them. So even small variations in the software that you run between your development environment and production can have a big difference on where your bottlenecks lie. One of the patch Tuesday updates for Windows 10 back uh, at the end of last May, I think it was, dropped UDP throughput by 40%, which is an absolute stonking uh, uh, regression in performance. And that, that was just a security patch. Uh, the next thing is unrepresentative workloads. So assuming we were going to test in development, well, we need some way of exercising our environment. Um, and actually, that, that can be very difficult, especially if, if we're trying to look for these unknown unknowns, the things that we don't actually know about beforehand. Um, it's very easy to say, OK, what, what is the distribution of requests across my different endpoints? Most people probably, ha probably have that information. But then you start to say, well, all right, well, what is the, for a given endpoint, what's the distribution of uh, requests between co uh, hold and, uh, hot and cold data? Well, that's a bit more complicated to answer. And then it's things like, how, what's the interdependence between requests to my different endpoints? And that's a much more complicated question to answer. Um, I once worked with a, uh, at a company where we had a, a misbehaving SDK in the wild that would do, uh, do three parallel requests uh, to three of our different endpoints, uh, but that those endpoints actually ended up mutating the same data. And you can imagine that you'd, you'd find all kinds of weird and wonderful contention issues there that you wouldn't have thought to actually uh, encode in, in a, uh, a workload test that you're running against your development environment. So it's very difficult to actually create uh, a workload that is representative of how production is being exercised. Um, and of course, the last wildcard we have is the JVM. So uh, if you're using Hotspot, it has a JIT, it does adaptive optimization. It adapts its optimization to how the code is actually being used. So if, if you can't exercise the environment that you're testing in exactly the same way as production, 
then there's no guarantee that actually it's been optimized in the same way in production. So you might actually be looking at something that performs, again, differently to your production environment. So in summary, um, don't be the dog. It's kind of cool, but you don't really want to be the dog. <laughs> cool. So having said we need to understand how systems work in a, a, a realistic production environment with a, with a real load, what kind of information can we gather from that production system to understand it? Well, firstly, people look at metrics. So uh, by metrics, uh, I mean some pre-configured numerical measure, at a re regular time interval, you pull some data out of that system. So for things like what's your CPU time usage, what are your page load times for individual requests, some kind of time series metric data. Metrics are often incredibly useful. They can narrow down problems incredibly uh, rapidly and tell you whether you get bottlenecked on different components in your system, where within your system some of those problems can lie. Uh, they're also incredibly cheap to collect. So when I say cheap to collect, uh, I don't mean how much actual cash you necessarily directly spend on these things. I mean, what's the performance overhead for gathering these things? These things are often very cheap to collect and often very cheap to aggregate, query, and store over, and lots of open source tooling around system metrics. So very useful. But system metrics aren't necessarily a solution in and of themselves. They're quite bad at telling you where inside your code base a problem specifically lies. Looking at system metrics extensively can often lead to these kind of murder mystery style debugging situations. Now that sounds like it's a really exciting Hercule Poirot role play situation. But unfortunately, the reality can be a little bit different. People go around, start systematically looking through these metrics. And often people are encouraged to collect as many metrics as their system can store, which can often be a lot. So you have a lot of different possible causes of a problem, and people start looking for anomalies and going, are you the metric that caused this problem? Are you the metric that caused this problem? Are you the metric that caused this problem? Before eventually finding something that's uh, unusual or, or problematic. It, it's kind of systematic guesswork in a way. Logging is another way you can extract useful information from production systems. So sometimes people have uh, manual logging that they've instrumented their code base with, which can often be incredibly useful, incredibly detailed uh, information about the system, but <laughs> A, that's manual work that you need to do yourself, B, logging in detail can rapidly become a big bottleneck or a big overhead and often the cause of a lot of performance problems in itself. Uh, GC logging is another case where the performance information can be useful, often much, much lower overhead and very useful, but again, uh, that's only for a specific subsystem and often GC logs are quite hard to interpret anyway. A lot of modern application performance monitoring, APM tools, use a different approach. So they use a very coarse-grained instrumentation approach. So what they do is they have some agent that sits within your software system. Uh, they weave in some information into your bytecode. Sounds very fancy, doesn't it? Weave it in there. Um, and take timings for a certain operation. So measure the time at the beginning of the operation, measure the time at the end of the operation, do a bit of subtraction, pull out the time that you can get for an operation, then, then you know how, how long it is. Uh, instrumentation can be a very, very useful way to see into your application in a way that metrics won't give you visibility into a black box. But instrumentation itself has a couple of big problems. Okay. Uh, the first problem that it has is potentially the more detailed your instrumentation is, the more instrumentation code you have to add into your application software itself. And the more code you add, the slower your system becomes. And the second thing is, in practice, because people just look at very coarse grained pictures, it has to be things that they've thought of a priori before uh, their system goes uh, into production in order to understand where that instrumentation should lie within the stack. Then there's production profiling. So what is profiling? Profiling is attributing some resource usage from the system to a component within your software stack. So what methods are using up CPU time? What lines of code are allocating objects? It could be where your CPU cache misses are coming from. It could be, you could profile for almost anything. Now, 
Profiling has some nice wins here. So firstly, it can be automatic. So that's to say, once you've got a profiler that works for uh, a JVM application, you don't necessarily need to customize your application to add any specific uh, aspect of it. Uh, production profiling can also be done very cheaply. We'll look later on in this talk about some of the technical approaches to make it really cheap. In practice, profilers are often not very cheap. If you try and hook up JVisual VM to production, you are in for a world of hurt. So I said earlier that instrumentation can be a little bit blind uh, in a lot of real world situations. So let's look at a kind of real example of that that we had from uh, a customer of ours. They had a problem where they had a slow HTTP endpoint uh, periodically. Like every five seconds, the endpoint would be really slow. Uh, they were using uh, an APM tool, so that was instrumenting all their HTTP request loads. And the graph on that was beautiful, green, you never got a bad request. If you just look at that graph, everything's fantastic. If you talk to the customers, they're really annoyed that they can't log into their system periodically. So, what was the root cause of that system? Well, the problem. Well, the root cause was Tomcat it has like a, a cache for the resources that you, um, HTTP resources, and it expires that cache periodically. And when it tries to reload those resources, they go and do a load of class path scanning. So the whole system grinds to a halt for two seconds whilst this happens. And that's something that uh, an instrumentation-based system didn't pick up because they were putting their instrumentation on the servlet request itself rather than looking at what the underlying system was. So they'd made this kind of ahead-of-time assumption about where problems were but didn't really follow through in the real world. And the other aspect of this is the overhead. I mean, these are tools that are meant to be helping you solve performance problems. So the more overhead the tools add, the worse the problem becomes. They can rapidly become the problem rather than help you solve problems. And that's the case with instrumentation. If you have instrumentation-based approaches which are very fine-grained and very detailed, they rapidly add so much overhead that you, you, have, to get a lot of, you have to get a lot of gains in order to win back that overhead from them. So surely there's a better way, right? Not just looking at metrics, but we want actionable insights. We want something that we can look at and say, where in our code base do we need to fix a problem? Um, so what about thinking about profiling in production? So that's what we call continuous profiling. So how would we consider using continuous profilers uh, in terms of your interaction with them? Well, suppose you get a, a problem that you need to investigate. Narrowing it down to a specific time period or some machines which are exhibiting this problem. Looking at a type of profile that you might want to gather, we'll see the difference between CPU time and wall clock time uh, in a sec. Looking at where the dominant consumer of the resource is. So where in your code base? What's really using up that time? Uh, and then fixing that bottleneck and, and deploying and iterating. So that's how this kind of stuff fits into the application developer uh, approach. Like very kind of agile, very iterative uh, uh, approach. Well, I said you can think about different kinds of time in terms of what your profiler can extract from your system. So CPU time or wall clock time, I would say the two biggest uh, forms of time that you can think about. So CPU time is time that you actually spend on CPU actually executing code. This wall clock time is the time between the beginning and end of the whole operation that you're trying to measure. Uh, so I like to think of this a bit like in a coffee metaphor. Maybe that's because I drink too much coffee. Uh, but yeah, if you go to any good coffee shop or even a Starbucks at lunchtime, you'll find that there's a big queue at the beginning of that system. So your CPU time is a bit like the time it takes the actual barista to make the coffee for you. And the wall clock time is a bit like the whole process time, waiting for someone to uh, prepare that coffee, waiting to be served on the other side. The whole operation time begin to end. Now, in order to understand problems, you need to understand both the information offered by CPU time and also wall clock time. So CPU time is very good 
because it allows you to diagnose computational hotspots, see what's actually using up the CPU, see where the actual inefficiency in your algorithm is. CPU time is also really good if you're looking at a production system. Because one of the things that production systems do, which systems in development under a load test don't do, is they spend most of their time idle. And CPU time will already tell you the actual things which you're executing rather than you're waiting around a lot. War clock time is very, very useful because it helps you diagnose problems that are about not using your CPU, time you spend waiting on disk I.O., time you spend waiting on lock contention issues, things like that. So it's really helpful in order to understand the full range of problems to, to, to look at both. There's a few different kind of uh, visualizations you have for profiling data. So hotspot uh, type profiling, I would say, is, is the simplest kind of visualization for that data. So this is just a list of methods in your system uh, sorted by the amount of time that they're using. And I think the, uh, so some hotspot visualizations show you also, for example, where within a method time is being spent, like line number information, or for example, you can get a, a hotspot view with, like, with a bottom up of stack traces that tells you what's the context for that. Another common uh, profiler uh, visualization is a tree view based visualization. So the tree view based visualization uh, basically arranges all the methods in your profiling data in a big tree. Within the tree, what is the parent is calling the child relationship. So for example, in Java, you might see uh, Java lang thread at the top of the tree and then child methods coming down off that. Flame graphs are a newer visualization for profiling data. So is anyone familiar with flame graphs or use flame graphs? Okay, cool, quite a, quite a few people, that's, that's good to see. Uh, so if you're not familiar with flame graphs, the way flame graphs work is each box within the flame graph represents a method. And you can see flame graphs either the more flamey way going up. This is top-down uh, uh, approach for flame graphs, which some people call icicles. Uh, so uh, in a top-down view, the methods which are calling their children are placed in boxes above, and then boxes that go down are the children. And then the width of the box indicates the total time within that method. So if you have a method that's wide and then has a very narrow child, that can often indicate a lot of self-time within that method. Um, and it shows you still that the, the width of the box indicates how much that method and its children are using. That's what I mean by total time. OK, so we talked about production profiling, what information we can get out of profiles, but how do they work under the hood? All right, <clears throat> so we're going to cover uh, some of the, we're going we're to cover basically how profiling works uh, in Java. And we'll start with the earliest type of profiler, and we'll go through some of the reasons why maybe people were resistant to putting uh, profilers into production, and then we'll see why that's become less of an issue uh, with the modern techniques for, for creating uh, production safe profilers. So the earliest type of profiler is what's called an instrumenting profiler. Now, instrumenting profilers add instrumentation to the code that's being tested in order to measure the consumption of whatever resource of interest we're interested in. Uh, so uh, if we were interested in, say, uh, war clock time, we could add instrumentation that would measure the time at the start and at the end of a method. So we'd add instructions there. And then using that, as the program runs, we can actually get information for how long it took to execute individual methods. Now, the problem with the instrumenting profiler is that in adding instructions to the, to the actual program we're testing, it modifies the behavior of that program. And it modifies the behavior in a way that's not uniform across all programs. So let's take the example that we were just talking about, about uh, a, a way of, of instrumenting method entry and exit. If you imagine a, a lovely, uh, well-refactored code base full of short, lots of short methods, uh, and then imagine a horrendous uh, code base that basically has only a half dozen methods that are like tens of thousands of lines long, clearly the impact of instrumentation is going to be different between those two code bases. The, the, the size of your methods uh, dictates how much of an overhead that instrumentation is going to add. So the, the overhead varies by the type of program we're actually testing, which means the results you get are actually very inaccurate. And add to that, it's actually very slow. Um, so can we do any better? Uh, well, uh, instead, of, instead of instrumenting the program under test, what we can do is we can do uh, statistical or sampling profiling. 
Now, sampling profiling works by taking the program under test, stopping it periodically, and then measuring the consumption of whatever resource we're interested in. So if we were interested in war clock time, we could take a program, we could stop it every, say, 100 milliseconds, and we could say, what are you doing? And then we could record that sample, and then over time, we can aggregate all those samples together, and we can build up a statistical picture of the performance of the program. So here we have a, uh, a, a diagram which shows um, how we would go about profiling this particular program here. So this is web server thread run. It calls controller do something, which, control, uh, which calls repo.readPerson, which then constructs a new person. And the green line is the point where we basically interrupt the program and we grab a sample. So the first sample we grab would be web server thread run. Uh, and then the next one we'd grab is in the new person constructor. And then we can aggregate all these together and we can produce, say, a flame graph or a tree view or a hotspot, whatever kind of profiling report you'd like. That's all nice in theory. But there's a problem. Uh, in Java, there is a way of getting uh, the, the, the um, state of the threads in, the, in um, Java application threads, and that's a call called get all stack traces. Before we discuss why get all stack traces is slightly problematic, we need to take a little detour via save points. How many people are aware of save points and what they are? Okay, please show of hands. Okay, so save points are a mechanism by which uh, the JVM can bring Java application threads to a halt, normally to do some kind of work, right? Uh, some kind of work that would be difficult to do or problematic to do while the application was still running. So uh, things with, with uh, bias locks, some GC operations, um, and safe points are, as the name says, they're safe points to do this work. And the way safe points are implemented, and the interpreter, there's, there are safe points after every instruction. Uh, with the JIT um, hotspot, uh, safe point, what are called safe point poles are added to compiled code. So what is a poll? A poll is simply a read from a known memory location. And these instructions are added at the beginning and at the end of compiled methods, and also inside certain types of loops. And all that happens is, is these, these simple tests, they read from a known memory location, and then when the JVM wants to bring the application to a halt, it can unmap or it can protect that memory location, and all these threads trigger a segmentation fault and the segmentation fault handler just kind of stops them and gets on with whatever else needs to be done. Um, so that's how safe points work. Uh, now, the problem with get all stack traces, uh, which is the JVMTI or JVM method for getting the uh, stack traces of the threads in the system, is that it requires a safe point. It requires being at a safe point to get that information. That's the point where it can safely say what the actual threads are doing. So we said at the beginning and at the end of a method and inside certain types of loops. So before we had our idealized sampling, now we have our sampling using the naive method, uh, which requires being at a safe point. And you can see now that instead of actually sampling the, the, instead of the green uh, arrows, which should have been our samples, actually what we're seeing, you're seeing these red points, those are the actual samples we'd end up taking because that's the nearest safe point. Right. So you can see that actually using the naive um, uh, implementation, you actually end up with bias samples. You end up seeing actually the safe points that are nearest to your actual um, uh, whatever you're trying to measure. And that's problematic because it means the results you're getting are not right. And then there's a, there's a second problem that makes this even worse. Uh, so one of, the, um, one of the optimizations that the JIT does that's actually very effective is that it, it does inlining, very aggressive inlining. So when it actually uh, compiles code, if you've got a method and it calls another small method and it passes certain tests, instead of um, that being actually done as a method call, the contents of the method being called are actually inlined into the caller. And in doing that, you can, you can optimize certain things away, one of which is the safe point, but other things like having to, park, having to store uh, arguments and registers and such like. But there's a big performance win from doing it, um, especially something like Java, where, say, for example, you might have lots of getters and setters and such like, which do well from being inlined. Now, inlining removes safe points. And this complicates our problem even more. So if we, if we look again, now we've lost the safe points actually in these, in these purple uh, methods, which have been inlined into their caller. So now, actually, we're seeing an even more distorted picture. We're not even just seeing the method necessary that was actually 
uh, causing the problem, we're potentially have att attributing that to a caller or a parent. And that's, that's problematic. Um, and Another thing that can also cause this kind of uh, problem where you don't have safe points with the regularity that you would expect is loops. Uh, regular loops have safe point poles within their loop header. Uh, and when you have a counted loop, so something that looks like four uh, int i equals zero, i less than n, where n is some compile time known constant, i plus plus, then you'll have the safe point pole on that loop removed as an optimization by the compiler. And this can result in longer periods of time going past without a safe point pole. And again, causing a bias between some threads and other threads. Sure. Now, the other problem we've got is that not only are the results that we're getting biased, but in getting that, that information, making that call, we are triggering a safe point. Now, as we said, safe points bring application threads to a halt. And they're in the beginning, and they're in certain types of loops, and at the end of methods. Um, and as Richard pointed out, sometimes you might actually go for quite a while. In, in very nice, well-optimized code, you might actually go for a reasonable amount of time without seeing a safe point. Now, the problem with that is that if you have, so this is a, a diagram that represents the system. You've got four threads in there. Uh, we've triggered a safe point. The first thread hits a safe point very quickly, as the second thread and the third thread joins them a little while afterwards. But the fourth thread, actually, it goes for quite a while before hitting a safe point. And when it finally does hit a safe point, then it too is parked, and the VM can get on with its whatever operation it wants to. Now, that time there between the first one and the last one, that's wasted time in the system. All this area that these threads are not running is, is extra latency that's in your system and actually wasted time. So by, uh, and why, why are we going through this? Well, it means that that actually limits the rate, even if you, ex even if you are happy with the biasing in the naive method of actually getting profiling information out of, of the JVM, uh, that doing it at the, um, the fact that you have to park these application threads limits the frequency at which you can do it. So the data you're getting is biased, and actually the frequency with which you can do it is relatively low without impacting the performance of the application. And that's why you can't take a lot of the desktop profilers and expect to hook them up to production and see that they actually give you, uh, they don't actually ruin production's performance. So what can we do about it? Um, so we've said, we've said why get all stack trace is expensive to do frequently, uh, it's inaccurate. Uh, also, it only gives us wall clock time. It's very hard to get CPU time out of that. Um, what do we do about that? Well, as we said, with sampling profiling, we need to do two things. We need to interrupt the application, and then we need to sample the resource of interest. And it turns out there's another way you can do this. Um, we can rely on, for interrupting the application, we can rely on what are called operating system signals. How many people are aware of operating system signals? OK, decent amount of hands as well. So signals are a way of the operating system asynchronously delivering a message to a process. So if you've ever kind of killed a process, you're, you're sending a signal to a process. That's sig term or uh, sig quit or one of them. Uh, now, uh, so you can use OS signals to deliver a message to a process, and the uh, kernel will actually make sure that message is delivered to one of the threads in that process. Um, and it's a very lightweight method. It's used, it's used a lot. Uh, it has some particular quirky kind of performance characteristics in terms of uh, you have to be very careful. Because a signal can be delivered to a, to a process, to a thread, at any point, you have to be very, very careful what you do inside the code that actually handles that signal. Because that signal handler, which is triggered when a thread receives a signal, that could be called inside a memory allocation. You could be called inside holding a mutex. You could be in any kind of state. You can't really, make much, you can't really reason much about where you are. So you have to be very careful about what you do inside of that signal handler. But within those constraints, it's possible to actually sample resources of interest that are actually useful. And one, one of those is uh, made possible by a call inside the JVM that's actually not an official one, but it's, uh, it's async get call trace. And what that does is actually say, I'd like the uh, current uh, call stack for the thread that I'm on. Right? And it's designed to be run inside of signal handlers. That's what the async means. It means it is safe to be called inside of a signal handler. It's not going to be allocating memory. It's not going to be holding any locks or anything that might deadlock the application. So we can actually, we can actually grab the current state. There's in, we can grab the, uh, the stack. And then we can also, if we're careful, we can reach inside the JVM and do other things at that point in time. But we have to be very careful what we do, because 
we can't rely on the state being consistent. But with those two, we can actually, uh, we can actually sample uh, from a Java application without a safe point bias. And we can do it uh, at reasonable uh, sampling rates with very, very low overhead. We're not, when a, when a signal is delivered to a thread, only that thread is running the signal handler. The rest of the system carries on running. There's no safe point, there's no waiting around. Um, it's not an approach used by any of the existing desktop kind of profilers, um, but uh, there are actually, um, and we'll come on to a further slide, there's some, there's some good open source profilers that do um, actually do that. So we have a way of profiling a very low overhead in a way that's, that's usable in a production environment. By choosing our, our sampling rate, we can basically make up um, our, our, our overhead as, as little as we like. Um, so why don't people actually do that? Well, our, our experience over the last um, few years has, has been that people are put off by practical issues as much as they are technical ones. So what are the practical issues around using some of these advanced profilers in a production environment? Um, well, the first thing is they generally require access to production. You're having to go to your ops people and say, hi, I'd like you to add this, this agent here to our um, Java flags. Um, so you've actually got to have access to production or you've got to get somebody to do something into production. Um, and in many organizations, that doesn't happen. The developers don't have access to production. And also, even if you do have access to production, the, um, the downsides of actually messing with a production environment normally end up being pretty catastrophic for you. Uh, so people tend to shy away from doing that. Um, in some organizations, there might even be legal barriers, Chinese rules between people who can write software that runs there and operations people as well. Sure. And then the process also involves manual work. So if you're doing ad hoc production profiling, you're saying, okay, I've got a problem, I want to hook up a profiler, get some information, analyze it. That normally actually requires running that on the server, collecting the information, copying it locally, running your analysis, then actually making your fix, and then repeating the whole process. Right? So there's a lot of manual work involved. And the other problem is, is that the actual uh, profilers that um, can, be do can do this in production tend to, be, uh, the open tend to be open source without commercial support. And that's, that for many organizations, that can also be a problem, running that in a production environment. So how could we work around this? Well, that got us thinking, as in, what if we, instead of just profiled in response to a problem, if the overhead is low enough, why don't we just profile all the time? Right? It removes some of the problems that we have. We don't have to have access to production each time we want to do an ad hoc profiling session, because we can just do it all the time. Um, and also, if we were profiling all the time, does it actually open up any new capabilities for us? Well, it does. For one, if we're profiling all the time, if your CPUs decide to peg at 3 o'clock in the morning and the next day you're doing a post-mortem, you can go back and say, well, we have that historical profiling data. What happened? What was actually running at that point in time? And if you're only doing ad hoc profiling, you can't do that. The other problem with doing ad hoc profiling in response to a problem is that you get this profiling information, but how do you know what normal looks like? Because you're, you're by definition looking at an abnormal system. Uh, if you've got historical data, you can go back and look at what normal looked like and compare the two. So it opens up some new capabilities. Um, you could say, well, a new version of our application performs poorly. How does that compare to our profiling information from the previous version? And then it also lets you start putting your samples in context. We talked about version. But you could start attaching environmental parameters. I've got uh, Amazon AWS C3s. How do they compare to the C4s? Um, I'm running this version of the JVM. How does it compare to this other version of the JVM? So we can start attaching that information to our profiling data. And that's something that you can't get with just ad hoc uh, profiling. So how can we actually implement continuous profiling? Well, there's a, there's a great paper um, from Google called Google Wide Profiling. Uh, continuous Profiling Infrastructure for Data Centers. It's up there on their website. You can get it. There's a PDF up there. And it basically details how their system works. They have collectors that take this data from their production environments. They have another system for collecting the binaries and doing symbolization, what have you. And that's then stored in databases, which their users can then run queries against. And you can actually generate these profiling reports, the kind of reports that we looked at earlier. And they have a system for doing this, and it's been running in Google for years. But what if you wanted to build it yourself. Well, we talked about some open source profilers. Um, these, these are open source profilers that use um, the method we, we looked at before that has low overhead uh, or something very similar. There's Async Profiler, there's Honest Profiler, which was written by Richard here. 
Uh, there's also a Java's flight recorder as well. And these are safe for hooking up to production, but it's worth pointing out they are, they are profilers that, that hook up to production for ad hoc profiling. You still need then some method to actually collect and store that information and then report it in some way. Um, and I know in some organizations I've worked in the past that we've, we've come up with ways of doing that, storing that information, and then be able to get it if we need it for analysis. Um, alternatively, uh, that's what we do at Opsian. We have a continuous profiling platform uh, which basically implements this. Uh, so you hook up the profiling agent to your JVMs. Um, it runs on your JVMs. They send their profiling data over to our uh, indexing and aggregation service, which basically aggregates all that and then makes it available for reporting uh, via uh, a browser-based interface and basically implements the, the, kind of the same kind of system we saw in the last few slides. So in summary, it's possible to profile in production with, lo with low overhead. You can do it in production with low overhead. Um, to overcome some of the practical issues around doing it, uh, you should profile all the time, and it makes life a lot easier. Uh, and by profiling all the time, it not only solves your practical issues from before, but actually opens up a, a whole bunch of new capabilities as well. Cool. So uh, in conclusion of the talk, we talked about why performance mattered, why we needed tooling to understand both the uh, known unknowns, but especially the unknown unknowns with regards to our, our system, things that we couldn't necessarily think of uh, in advance. We talked about how developments and production environments often differ so much that you can have very different root causes to performance problems, that you can have very different load tests and you can find it hard to replicate those problems. We talked about how things like metrics are incredibly useful for gathering from a production system, understanding a problem, but aren't necessarily going to give you the root cause analysis, aren't going to give you the vector into your system. Instrumentation was a, an approach that could give you that, but had a very high overhead if you wanted to do it at a fine grain level, and at a coarse grain level had less useful information. And continuous profiling could provide a lot of insight. So we think we need a bit of an attitude shift on profiling and monitoring. Um, we want profiling to be done in a systematic way, not an ad hoc way. So that means keeping it done continuously all the time uh, on your system and not having to do things like hook up tooling when there's a problem uh, or, or, or a one-off event that you need to resolve. Being proactive about these things rather than reactive, having uh, things uh, in place to understand and resolve these issues. In other words, please do production profiling all the time. That's what we'd love you to do. Um, if you use our tooling, that's great. But even if you don't, that's also great. Just please do it. It's really useful, and I'm sure you will find it is very helpful to, to your, uh, your systems as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. We have five minutes or so for questions. Right in the front. There's a front row. Uh, if I understood correctly, uh, you provide um, a solution where we can inject some agent into our application, and you will collect these metrics, and we can access them uh, via some uh, web-based interface. But the question is, is it possible to install uh, some uh, uh, housing uh, implementation of this? So can so it be... Is there an on-prem version of Opsian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is exactly. the question? Yes. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be... Because, you know, sometimes it's just uh, from perspective of some... Yes. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to... As in uh, that instance. the aggregation can happen and storage can happen inside your premises or in the cloud. Okay. Were there any other questions? Oh. At the back. Um, hi there. Uh, have you ever considered using the output of your profiling in any form of automated testing to try and highlight um, code change problems for in, within algorithms? So we were having an interesting discussion earlier today. It's a really good question. We were having an interesting discussion earlier today um, about could we use the information to say identify where in very large code bases, hey, you're actually using this particular method uh, and that's only available in a really old version of, the of this library you're using. And actually, if you use this newer method, it would be a lot quicker. Um, so yeah, there are, there are possibilities for that. There's possibilities for, say, security, where you know, you're actually using this method and, and actually that's deprecated because it's got a, 
vulnerability issue in it kind of thing. Um, so yes, you, you could use the data you get out of a, a profiling system for that kind of stuff. Um, but I think it was also, maybe I interpreted it a different way, which was, uh, could you have like J, like J unit tests? You mean, can you profile J unit tests? Is that the question you're asking? No, okay, great. <laughs> uh, cool. Any other questions? Oh, there's a few at the back. There are a over there. Um, is, Ops, is Opsian just gathering the statistics and presenting them, or does it include its own profiler? Or so is it, it built it, on somebody else's profile? It includes it's, it includes its own profiler. So it's it's uh, uh, we basically did a lot of development work on top of Richard's Honest profiler, uh, which has a kind of long history of kind of being used in production. Uh, so yeah. Thanks. Great talk. Uh, have you any experience of uh, aggregating this kind of uh, profiling in? distributed uh, computing, like Spark jobs, Hadoop, and stuff like that? So we do, uh, yeah, so we do in terms of aggregating uh, jobs that are similar. Uh, a lot of them are, a lot, a lot of what we've seen are more people like web request response oriented workloads rather than something like Spark. Uh, but um, in general, when you're looking at things like profiling data and where the bottlenecks are, um, often, you can quite nicely aggregate over different machines. Uh, things like knowing what an individual <laughs> thread ID that had a specific problem or something like that don't come up so well. Uh, but if you're looking for bigger code efficiency problems, it works. Yeah. When, when, well. when we've looked at Spark, things like Spark before, if your problem is a CPU problem, um, so you're, you're, you're converting stuff inside a particular part of your job, then it's, it's pretty obvious. If your problem is deep within Spark of how it's transferring the data, it's a bit more problematic because of the async nature of the whole thing. Um, yeah. So it really depends on your bottleneck. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, run down, right down the front. Oh, over there as well. Uh, do you risk, with if you implement continuous profiling, shifting some things to the right? So what I mean by that is, we often want things to be caught we want to shift things to the left. We want people to consider <coughs> profiling and performance early and testing. Do you risk people going, oh, I've got continuous profiling in production. I'm, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to wait and see how it works in production. And do, do, do people come, become complacent with continuous profiling? That's kind of a, that's a really good question. Um, I don't really have any like nice head-to-head double-blind scientific study on that kind of thing. But my general experience on these things is that people basically do that anyway. And then when things hit production, they're blind. Um, and even when they do have performance testing uh, ahead of time, that can hit, help them identify and solve certain problems. But there's often things that they miss anyway. So um, I think there's a risk of complacency with either approach. And that's probably more uh, like cultural team honesty reflection type value type issue rather than the technology solution tool type issue, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. My question is about your profiler. Do you provide some information, some detailed information about threads which are not currently uh, doing some Java stuff? I mean, native libraries, kernel calls, uh, and so on, as it is done in a scene profiler, for example. So, as in, uh, so that's war clock in terms of when threads are not actually actively doing work, they're just blocked yeah. on something. Mm, um, yeah, but you want to know where. Because uh, if you will just look at stack trace in Java, you will see that it does something. So, so you're, you're thinking the actual lock itself that it's blocked on? Or? I mean, some more deep information. What's uh, uh, where the Java thread is spending time inside kernel, for example? Oh, inside the kernel, right? Um, no. So, uh, you, as you were saying, things like async profiler, you can go into the kernel further. Um, we don't uh, with our product. Um, mainly because actually, for one, there are security issues around once you start getting in, into that, and it starts to get a bit more problematic saying to people, hey, install this on your production service, oh, and by the way, it needs to be root kind of thing, or it needs to have certain elevated privileges. Um, but uh, the other, other issue is performance as well. Um, so we want to make sure that you stay. If you can, what we found, if you can get yourself within a small enough envelope that basically there isn't a criticism of actually it's going to slow down production, then it's, it's a much easier process of getting this into production. Um, in answer to your question. 
think we're pretty much out of time. But thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you.